Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. All right, good. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Yuki Kaneko, and I will be talking about short gamma ray bursts uh, today. And thank you very much, first of all, for the organizer uh, for this net, very nice workshop and inviting me to talk about uh, gamma ray bursts. Um, I, while I was preparing, I noticed that, um, you know, talking about short gamma ray bursts, giving overview in like 30, 40 minutes is very tough. <laughs> so I decided <laughs> to uh, focus, I will try to focus on uh, the highlights and, you know, main point of uh, gamma ray bursts and especially short gamma ray bursts. Uh, some of you may be wondering, you know, if you're not familiar with short gamma ray bursts, you know, what's the connection between a neutron star and, and gamma ray bursts? Um, I'll try to make that connection, but later on today, you will be listening about um, the merger of neutron stars and also a CNM, I think after this, we'll be talking about afterglow of, short, uh, of gamma ray bursts. So I will focus on observational points of view, uh, observational facts um, from gamma ray observation point of view, okay? And uh, so here is like a, a screenshot of a simulation. And this is a little maybe outdated. I'm not sure, I think this was a while back, uh, but this shows how neutron stars may um, merge. And then as it merges, this is a simulation of magnetic field lines and how it connects and then how this can launch some sort of jet. But uh, I'd like to uh, bring your attention to this millisecond time scale. It's like, you know, the whole thing is 26 milliseconds. So this happens pretty quickly. And then when the jets are formed, uh, if we are in the right orientation, if, you're, if we see inside of the jet, then that's what we see as gamma ray burst. That's what we, we think. Okay. So I like to uh, connect to you know, the observational point of view to this neutron star merger. Okay. Uh, gamma ray burst, you know, uh, it's very, very diverse in a sense, um, in terms of light curve, the timing property, not timing, but how do you say the morphology as a function of time. So like these are one, two, three, four, five, six example of gamma ray bursts. And um, people used to say, you know, when you see a gamma ray burst, you saw a burst. You know, it's so diverse that, okay, I saw, you know, this one, it's lasting for 150 seconds, right? But then the next one is five seconds and it's only one peak or two peaks. Uh, here it's lasting for 60 seconds, 20 seconds, 60 seconds. And this is very, very short. You see like this is one second right here. So this is in a uh, sub, sub second time scale. So we see all sorts of uh, light curves. And then, okay, but we can determine the duration of these events. And if you try to plot the duration or the population, the distribution of uh, these durations. So this is a number of events versus um, duration of events burst. And you can kind of see a little bit of hump at the lower end. And then there's kind of, you know, um, this is in log scale, but kind of log normal distribution of this duration. Okay? And it goes in, in uh, like one, two, three, four orders magnitude, four or five even orders of magnitude in duration in seconds. And this before, so this is actually the uh, recent observation observational results from uh, GBM. I'll talk a little bit about those instruments. Uh, but before this GBM, in 90s, we had um, another experiment called BATSI. And that's how, you know, we know a lot about um, GRB to date. And based on that distribution, BATSI distribution, I will show it to you a little bit later. We kind of decided, okay, two seconds is, you know, a dividing line that can, you know, uh, distinguish two different population of bursts, and that's historically, you know, just two seconds was picked, 
Uh, but there's nothing clear, as you can see you know, from the distribution, there's not, no, no cut in a sense at two seconds that divides, clearly divides short and long events. So when we talk about short GRBs, yes, we are talking about these events, uh, GRBs that are, the duration is shorter than a few seconds usually, but it could be like up to five seconds or so because the distribution for the lower one, it goes, you know, um, there, there's a quite number of events that could belong to both short um, and long, okay? So this is kind of dividing line. And in general, when you estimate how much energy is emitted in gamma rays, in these, you know, both short and long, uh, the total energy is about 10 to 51 to 252 ergs. And that, you know, is of the order of rest mass energy of the sun. So imagine the rest of mass, rest mass energy of the sun is released in like, you know, 10 seconds or even like one second. So that's a lot of energy and a lot of energy release that we're talking about. So we need to have some sort of a very, you know, I don't know, catastrophic event, a very strong uh, event that produces this. But on the contrary, if you look at the GRB spectrum, energy spectrum, it's actually pretty constant. So it doesn't matter, you know, which one, but, you know, chances are any parts of these uh, events this one or this one, or it doesn't matter. You can describe the spectrum uh, in this, uh, what's called a bands function, was proposed by bands uh, in 1993. And we still use this function to describe um, the spectrum, spectra of GRBs. Okay. And this is, what this is, is actually just the two parallels connected with each other. So. Uh, this is an energy spectrum. It's a, a photon counts, the uh, photon flux actually as a function of energy. And these are, these are both log scales. So you have the parallel function as a straight line here. And you have a low energy parallel and high energy parallel connected kind of smoothly at some break energy. Okay. But when we talk about Energetics or the, the GRB uh, spectral parameters, we use a lot this terminology um, parameter E peak. And this E peak is a little bit different from E break, but this is the peak of what we call new F new spectrum. And for th those of you who are not familiar with spectrum, uh, new F new is photon flux per energy is here. And you just integrate that twice over all energy. So it's like you know, E squared times this photon flux. And this becomes the, the new F nu, which shows um, how much energy is emitted at which energy band. Okay? So here E peak is around uh, one MeV or a little bit less than one MeV here. So the most of the energy or the, the most energy is emitted around this energy band is what it means. Okay, so then if you look at the distribution of this alpha, beta, and then E peak, the distribution is pretty narrow, I will say, you know, for the diversity of the light curve that we observe. So this is uh, like a distribution of time resolved spectrum uh, and also the time integrated spectrum, the whole burst or the, you know, um, uh, each time bin spectrum. But you can see that in both cases, alpha is around minus one, beta is about minus 0.2, E peak is about 200, 300-ish here, okay? And this time integrated and resolved, it matters because within the burst, like this is one burst, just an example. You can see the light curve in, in dotted line uh, in both cases. And this is as a function of time. This is alpha, the low index, and this is E peak. And you can see that alpha, both alpha and E peak varies a lot during, um, within a burst, right? And this kind of uh, evolution, we, we call it hard to soft because it does you know, go from hard E peak to low E peak. Okay? And also the alpha becomes fairly, you know, 
uh, soft as it goes, as the time goes. And this is just one type of evolution that we see. We do see other events that have uh, that tracking behavior. So the hardness of the spectrum actually tracks the photon flux. So the brightest part is the hardest and the dimmer one is uh, dimmer part is softer. Okay, so spectral evolution wise, there are um, variety. And who observed this or we observe it, but we observe with which instrument, right? Uh, so in 90s, as I mentioned, burst and transient source experiment, BATSI, uh, was uh, specifically designed to detect GRBs. Okay? And it was on top of uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. This, is, this was very special, actually. This is an actual real picture of uh, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory uh, taken by astronaut in, in space shuttle. And that's pretty cool because this, this was really heavy. It was a huge observatory that it couldn't be launched with a rocket. So it had to be launched with the, uh, uh, what is it, a space shuttle. Okay. So this is one of the coolest pictures that I have. And um, it observed in, in nine years, 2,700 GRBs. And right now we have Swift and uh, Fermi telescope in orbit. And they are actively monitoring, monitoring observing uh, GRBs right now. And so far the Swift burst alert, burst alert telescope is right here observed about 1400 GRBs. And then Fermi gamma ray burst monitor GBM have observed about 3000 GRBs. So we have observed a lot of GRBs. Um, so we have you know, uh, a lot of data to work with, but also the short GRBs are not you know, that many compared to the long GRBs. Okay? And these, all these are sensitive to this 100 kV to 1 MeV, like the, these area, these energy range. So this shows the effective area. So this is kind of the sensitivity of the detectors. And for BATSI, for two detectors, different detector of BATSI, that is the black curve. And it shows, you know, the, it's sensitive about um, around 100 kV. Okay. And then here, red and blue are GBM detectors. Okay, so GBM has two different type of detectors, but you can see that the coverage is a little bit wider now, the energy coverage okay, compared to, to BATSI. And the earlier spectral shape that I showed, you know, kind of falls in here. So this is about 200, 300 kV here. So this is, there's an energy break right here, and then it goes something like this. Okay, so these are all designed to be most sensitive around this break energy. And, and then the, lastly, the bat, swift bat sensitivity goes something like this. And swift bat uh, has a, a great capability of localizing the events really, really well. BATC and GBM does not, do not have the localization capability because it's an old sky monitor. And I'll show you why it's all sky monitor in a, min in a minute. But swift bat, if it's observed, if the GRB is observed with the swift bat, then uh, most likely it can be localized really nice. Well, okay. And location of GRBs, you know, it happens in all over the place. So this is a galactic coordinate uh, location plot of all GRBs that we have, um, has been observed with GBM. And uh, you may have seen a galactic coordinate uh, picture of this galactic plane. So if it happens in the galactic plane, it will be along this horizontal line at the center like this. So as you can see, it really happens all over the sky. And because of that, Batsy and GBM both are made to observe all sky to kind of monitor, you know, uh, try to catch as many G GRBs as possible. And some of, some of them, you see like many blue points here. I don't know if it's visible to you, but these are the ones that are observed with GBM and also with Swift Bat. So there are quite a number of them that we have both uh, 
detectors or observatory observing these events. Okay. And short events. Um, okay, I showed you a little bit earlier the Fermi GRB um, duration distribution, but here's a comparison. Bat GRB distribution duration distribution is like this. This is Fermi GBM. This is Batsy. And you can see that the Batsy distribution shows a little more distinctive kind of value here, right? Around two seconds. And that's exactly why we chose two seconds as, you know, well, not we, but you know, people usually choose around two seconds historically. Okay? But after Batsy, when we start uh, observing GRBs with BAT and GBM, we saw that this distinction is a little bit less. So it seems like more you know, continuous distribution. Okay? So um, there's still you know, a lot of people started trying to study the classification of you know, short population and long population. Okay? But it seems like there are two populations, but not that clear. And you can see from these plots too, Batsy observed the most, the highest fraction of short GRBs. It was about 25% of all Batsy events were, were short, less than two seconds. And uh, sweet bat and GBM is, is much less, it's detecting much less. You know, it could be uh, dependent on um, the sensitivity, detector sensitivity or trigger mechanism. Uh, but for whatever the reason, it's detecting a little bit less. And other things that distinguishes short GRBs from long ones is the hardness, not, not exactly distinguishing actually, I must say. You can see here the hardness ratio, the flux uh, of hard energy and low energy versus T90. So two seconds is around here, right? You can say there's a tendency of short events being a little hotter spectrally. But you, know, you don't see a really clear correlation here either. Okay? But for other, you know, whatever the instruments that we see when we plot hardness versus duration, this is what we see. So the, the shorter one tend to be a little bit hotter. Okay? And that's why some people call it short hard uh, GRBs and long soft GRBs, and this is why. So in addition to spectral hardness, uh, there are some differences, but again, this, because the sample sizes are much smaller in, GR, in short GRBs than long GRBs, uh, we have less information to work with. But we do have some afterglow uh, observation of these GRBs. Afterglow is what happens, uh, the electromagnetic radiation at lower energies X-ray optical, ultraviolet optical uh, radio that is observed right after the gamma ray burst. And because short events are very short and it's really hard to localize right away and then try to catch the, the afterglow light. Uh, but we do have some observations, um, especially in X-rays, we have you know, probably almost close to 100 maybe because of SWIFT, uh, but we have very few radio observation, for example, from short GRBs. And they're thought to be happening in a very faint, uh, they're, they're, the afterglow is thought to be expected to be faint actually because of the environment um, that neutron star you know, merger happens. But I'll mention it to you a little bit later, okay? And also for those who, um, those events that we were able to localize based on afterglow observation and determine the distance or the host galaxy based on optical observation. We can see that um, there are mixed types actually of host galaxies. Long GRBs, many of the long GRB, most of the long GRBs with afterglow, host galaxies were identified to be uh, star forming galaxies. But for short GRBs, we can see that the, some, of, some of the host galaxies are, are early type, some are late uh, type. So you know, there's still um, 
not really a settled uh, case here. But all, almost all GRBs that short GRBs that we have been able to um, measure redshift of cosmological redshift we we're talking about. So that tells about the distance. Uh, they're all low redshift, less than one. So you know what we're detecting is very close by actually. I'll show you uh, this little bit more information in the next slide. And the progenitors, uh, you know, the most, um, the strongest candidates is a neutron star or a compact object merger. And um, I'll show you the, some evidences that we have for that. And then we have some extended emission, short GRBs with extended emission that really complicates the things, you know, issues even more. So I'll try to mention all of this uh, in, for the rest of the, the talk. Okay. Then after the law of um, short GRBs, it's, we, we, ha we have quite a number of X-ray afterglow observation because of the SWIFT, as I said, uh, but optical observation is needed for determining the host galaxy, and then also, you know, getting the spectral lines for the cosmological redshift to determine this, uh, the redshift value and determine the distance. So in 2005, there are these three events that came out like on top of each other almost, with all with the afterglow observation. And this one in May uh, was observed to be in an elliptical galaxy. And then the next one in July, turned out to be it was in a star forming galaxy. And then the community was really puzzled. Okay, so which one? <laughs> and then the third one in July, later July, there was one more observed in elliptical galaxies. And then this one uh, is for, for this 050724. This is the actual um, optical observation of, um, of this event. And you can see the elliptical galaxy, and then you can actually locate the GRB. This is the afterglow of GRB in optical. And this what's happening in outskirts of the galaxy, the host galaxy. And uh, this one also in a star forming galaxy, but this one also was observed at the outskirt of the galaxy. So that is actually consistent with like a neutron star merger scenario because you know those are um, those could be happened. Those should be happening in an early type galaxy because the star has has to have evolved uh, to those merging um, ages. But um, because when when they merge and when they form black hole or magnetar or whatever the you know the even more compact object, um, there has to be some sort of kick velocity, and that will just you know kick everything to. Uh, the whole system to outskirt of the galaxy anyway. And that's why the afterglow is expected to be um, dimmer, the, yeah, the less bright, because afterglow is, uh, it depends on the interstellar medium density. So outskirts of the galaxy, of course, the density is lower there. So, uh, and that is, you know, still consistent, but we do have many more observations of, of host galaxy of GR, uh, what is it, short GRBs, yes, but it's still not settled. Do you see here, uh, this is from Berger um, review of short GRBs. So this is a number of events, short, yeah, the all short and long events as a function of redshift. Okay, the long GRB redshift can go pretty high. This is still kind of debated. I think it's not confirmed yet, but you know, eight redshift is, is pretty, um, it, we have like a few of them there. But anyway, if you look at the short GRB redshift, you can see that um, as we do have something more than one. Yeah, I correct what I said, All right? But on average, you know, most of them are less than one in redshift. Okay, so all the, um, most of the, the short GRBs that we observe happens close by. 
it's not that it happens close by, but we observe that uh, the ones that's happening close by. And then this is the type of galaxies, host galaxies uh, for short events. Um, you can see that it's, you know, some of them are late, some of them are early. So, you know, the type of host galaxies can vary. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't say anything about the long GRBs, how, you know, what is um, creating long GRBs, but because remember the um, spectrum, energy spectrum, it's pretty consistent. It's pretty um, uniform in a sense, you know, the, it, it doesn't matter what duration it is. We think that the emission mechanism has to be similar for short, short and long GRBs, whatever the, you know, um, the progenitor may be, okay? So the emission mechanism, um, one of the most popular view is that the, you know, the GRB has to be in jet somehow in collimation to account for the energy that we see. If it's, you know, if you see this much of energy and then if it's emitted isotropically, then the estimated energy, the emitted energy is actually huge. It's like too much. Uh, so, so we can't really explain. So we have to have a, a collimation. We do have some evidence uh, for collimation also, the jet angles uh, from the long GRBs. Okay. So in within the jet, there's some sort of ejecta that has like a slower and faster speed. And because of the difference in speed, and these are all kind of relativistic, you know, speed, um, because of these difference in speeds, they collide with each other. And then somehow um, the magnetic field is created there. And then, you know, because of the Fermi acceleration mechanism within that, the, those colliding shells, the electron, the seed electrons within that um, shell gets, uh, how do you say, gets accelerated and radiates. And that's what we see as a gamma rays. And that's why we see the non-thermal radiation, non-thermal spectrum. And then after that, this shell keeps expanding, expanding and it encounters interstellar medium. And that when, when the jet collides with the interstellar medium of less density, then that's what creates X-ray visible uh, radio as an afterglow. So this happens, of course, after the gamma ray burst, uh, and also happens in, in lower energy, okay? Because the ejecta is already you know, slower. Okay? And um, short GRBs, yes, it, it's uh, the most popular theory is the merger of two compact objects, uh, two neutron stars, maybe and colliding into black hole. The other, the long GRB scenario is, um, yeah, some people call it the hypernova scenario, but it's a massive star. It's a core collapse of a massive star. So the, the massive star you know, collapses in, into on itself and then it explodes and then it, it uh, turns into a black hole. So the problem with the short GRBs of few seconds that we observe is that few seconds is too long for neutron star merger scenario and too short for a long GRB hypernova scenario, the collapser scenario. So that's why you know, people are trying to, to get more information and try to um, refine the theory so that we can explain what we observe. And here's a simulation actually. Um, yes, I have video, I don't know if it's gonna show. Can you see the video? Yeah? Okay. Yes, no problem. All right, good. So you can see these two stars kind of merging with each other and then black hole is formed in the middle. And again, this is in the milliseconds, tens of milliseconds scale. And then it forms some sort of accretion disk around the, the black hole. But apparently this uh, black hole, uh, the accreting onto black hole only happens, you know, dissipates in like a few um, tens of milliseconds, I think most. So that's why you know it's really hard to sustain 
the emission for um, a few seconds. And then on top of it, uh, this simulation also shows, so this is the matter density that you see, and then these blue and, and um, green are the uh, magnetic field actually. And you can see that yes, these lines, you know, it kind of entangles and then it finds some sort of in again, like 26 milliseconds or so. Okay. It comes into like a jet shape. There you go. So in 26 millisecond, it made the magnetic field line became some sort of jet shapes. And this may be, uh, you know, uh, driving the, the gamma, making the gamma ray burst uh, along with this electromagnetic field line. Okay. And that is great because, yeah, so here the collapse happens and however it happens, it happens. And then the, the end central engine is ejecting this ejector. Fine, but how to launch these jets is uh, another challenge. And you know, for both scenario, because it's like so much dense, you know, environment, and also, um, you know, in the black hole, uh, the neutron star merger scenario, you have to kind of sustain that central engine. Okay, uh, so one of the this scenario that they're suggesting uh, is that this forms a magnetar, and then like those magnetic field can somehow sustain that. Um, radiation. And CNM, I think it's going to talk about that a little bit, not, not necessarily for short GRBs, but in, in general about the afterglow, the magnetar. And very recently, uh, 2017 in August, you all have heard about this uh, most likely. I, LIGO detector detected the gravitational wave from neutron star uh, mergers. And Along with this, a GRB was detected. It wasn't triggered. It didn't trigger the detector, but um, afterwards when they searched after this gravitational detection, wave detection, they found in GBM and then also integral SP have observed this event. It's very, very faint. It's much fainter than regular uh, short GRBs, but they did find this. And there was a two second delay. So from here, you can, uh, like they were trying to estimate the propagation time of the gravitational wave and uh, uh, light propagation speed uh, from this delay. The, like I said, GBM does not have a very good location capability. So, uh, you know, when you see a burst like this, you know, we are not sure if this is from you know exactly that uh, location of this merger or not. But from here, you can see that error circle of this is uh, LIGO error circle and this is GBM error circle. And these gray lines are SPI, um, it's, uh, SPI band, you can say observational band. So you can see that all of them coincide at the location of uh, this LIGO event. Okay, so this is, uh, I think it is pretty convincing. Uh, so we did see a first kind of evidence of short gamma ray bursts associated with uh, neutron star merger. Okay. So that's a good thing. Um, so that, that's like a first direct uh, evidence that we observed. And there are a lot of effort of uh, trying to, to detect another one and also uh, try to do offline search, trying to detect, um, find a similar short GRBs that is like less energetic like this and um, trying to match the, the gravitational wave data. Okay. And as I mentioned, there's a short GRBs with some extended emissions or maybe it's a long GRB, we, we don't know. So this one, in 2006, this was observed. And this was kind of the first case that we observed something really, really puzzling. So this was observed with bat, swift bat. And 
the duration, as you can see from the light curve, the duration of this event determined with that was 100 seconds. So of course it's a long event, right? It just uh, going with the duration. But for long events, and this happened pretty close, it's a Z is, is uh, 0 0.1. So it's a, you know, by GRB scale, it's a pretty close event. And if the event is this close, and if this event is long GRBs, and then it was caused by, you know, this massive star collapse, then there has to be a supernova signature that's visible in optical band. So there was extensive uh, search for supernova signature and they did not find anything. So they were really puzzled. Okay, so this looks like a long event, but it, you know, we don't see um, any you know, supernova signature, which, which should be visible at this close distance. And on top of it, there are some other you know, uh, spectral lag information that, that we got from here, from this event uh, wasn't matching the long GRB property, the characteristic that we have seen before. And also uh, if this was observed, this, this would have been observed with the Batsy. We did some simulation and we saw that in Batsy, this faint um, tail emission, this extended emission wasn't observed. So the Batsy would have classified this as a short event. So there are cases like this. And recently we have two more cases um, that's not just from, from the duration, but overall property of afterglow hardness, like everything, when we compare it, uh, when we look at it, it's not really matching a short GRBs or it's kind of somewhere between short GRBs and long GRBs. Uh, so you can see this is again, the hardness ratio and, and uh, duration information and these two events are fitting right in the middle. So it's not, not clear. And also we have searched uh, something similar to these events, short GRBs with extended emission um, using Batsy, GBM and Swift GRB data. And we have found uh, about 30, um, 50 probably total events that has, you know, this is the one that we found. It has a very, very short spike, but it has a kind of um, hump emission afterwards, extended emission that's much dimmer. But still, this is bright um, for our detector. And then when we look at these extended emission versus the spike, we see that, uh, yes, we still see hardness ratio. Uh, differences, not, not exactly differences, but you can see the tendency again, that short, this is duration here in harness, uh, short spikes right here have a little bit harder spectra compared to extended emission part. And peak flux, actually there's a, a little bit of uh, positive correlation between the extended emission peak flux and spike peak flux. So when the peak flux is higher in spike, extended emission tend to be uh, brighter. But again, it's not a very strong correlation, but we can see the, the relation. And then also when we look at the spectral lags, we can see that, um, so this is spectral lag. So this means the higher energy component comes a little bit before, a little bit before the uh, lower energy component. And we can see that the extended emission, the lags are a little bit more. And lags are usually observed for longer uh, GRBs, long GRBs. So this is more, uh, a little bit more like a long GRB uh, properties, characteristics. And what could explain this uh, short burst and extended emission, the difference between them? This is uh, a one model uh, by Barkov and Potanenko in 2011. And he's, they're suggesting two component model like this. So you have a black hole with disc and first neutrino heating happens. There's a, um, from this merger, there has to be neutrino and anti-neutrino and they have to, uh, 
make pairs. So those pair, pair creation uh, actually is what we see first as the short spike. And then afterwards, this electromagnetic Blanford uh, genetic jet is what we see as extended emission. That's their suggestion. And we did test uh, using this and we tried to, to constrain this uh, ratio of opening angles. And we see that for all cases that uh, neutrino um, jet, neutrino jet is wider than uh, Blanford genetic jet, this electromagnetic jet. And finally, um, yes, this is my last slide. Finally, so I, I want to, to mention SGRs because, um, you know, the earlier talks, they talked about magnetars, the GRB, uh, short, short bursts from magnetars. So when we observe a gamma ray burst, short gamma ray burst, how can you tell that if it's not the, the SGR, but it's short GRB? Right? The, the most um, clearest difference is the hardness. Soft gamma repeaters are soft gamma repeaters, and it's repeaters, so it comes from the same same place. And short GRBs never repeat. So far, never repeated. Okay. So soft gamma repeaters hardness you can see quite distinctively that this is much softer. This is short GRB. The GRBs uh, are harder, much harder. Okay. So from here, spectra characteristics you can see, and for SGRs. Uh, spectra are usually thermal or two or three thermal components model. Okay, but GRB spectra is really uh, non-thermal. Okay. And lastly, I'd like to mention this one. Uh, so this is, uh, this was just published recently. Um, this event was originally classified as short events. And you can see the millisecond here, the time scale, the event itself is very, very short, but it's pretty variable. And in addition, the spectra characteristics, spectra was pretty, it's, it's very hard actually. And it's a little bit different from what we see or what we expect from uh, short GRBs. But it was very similar to the giant flare SGR giant flare spectral characteristics that we have seen before. So then what they're suggesting here is that this is, uh, and this was localized to a, a nearby galaxy. So this could be an extra galactic giant flare from uh, a magnetar. And that's what they're suggesting here. So, you know, there still, you know, could be um, non-clear cut, um, how do you say this? It's not, it's not very clear if a burst is a SGR or um, a short gamma ray burst. There are cases like that, but um, I hope that kind of connects back to the neutron star, uh, the whole story. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions or any comments on the Last talk before going to the lunch break. If not, then I'm going to just thank you very much.